This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. <laughs> this is a show about science by scientists. Let's check out our team of hardcore nerds. I'm Phil Torres, I'm an entomologist. Tonight, a special edition of Techno. The revolution on the road. I'm behind the wheel of an experimental Toyota fueled by hydrogen. Its only emission, water. Could this be the new way to fill her up? Then, Dr. Shinny Somara is a mechanical engineer. The latest in crash test dummies and how researchers are turning to 3D imaging to make those dummies a little smarter. This is a fantastic graphic of the different impacts. Costa Gramanis is an engineer who's designed everything from satellites in space to bionic eyes. I love watching the steering wheel just spin itself. <laughs> Giving us a whole new meaning to being a backseat driver. That's our team, now let's do some science. I'm Phil Torres, driving along the beautiful Southern California coast. I'm behind the wheel of one of Toyota's hydrogen-fueled demo vehicles, which is one of a slew of innovations that are making the car of the future the car of now. The streets of Torrance, California, a testing lab for the next game-changing alternative fuel vehicle. Here, it's electric versus hybrids, and soon, the newest entrant, a hydrogen fuel cell car. This is the hot room at Toyota's technical center, where they've tested Toyota's hydrogen fuel cell car, the first one that will hit the consumer market. This is the future of what Toyota's making. Jackie Birdzall is a fuel cell engineer. For me personally, I've been working on this project for 11 years, so to actually finally see it coming to production is really exciting and, and also a little nerve-wracking. What is inside a fuel cell vehicle? What makes a difference? Instead of having the gasoline combustion engine driving the wheels, we have a fuel cell driving the wheels. And a fuel cell creates electricity on demand by combining hydrogen and oxygen in what's called an electrochemical reaction. The reaction occurs in the fuel cell stack when a membrane between the hydrogen and oxygen strips the hydrogen atom of its one electron. The electricity is generated as that electron moves around the fuel cell to hook up with the oxygen to produce H2O. So this thing only emits water? Only water. I can go show you. All right. So this is where the water comes out? Exactly. It'll mostly be a mixture of water vapor and just a few droplets. But if we really want to see the water, there's also a purge button, I there understand. There is a purge button. Let's get some water. This is the big purge. That is kind of amazing. I want to drink this, but you're saying I probably shouldn't? Probably not. You know, it gets atmospheric dirt in it and environmental dirt in it. So, so I don't really want road some, water. No, I wouldn't recommend road water. Unlike most cars, the undercarriage is wrapped up tight. If we were to take the plastic covers off, you would see a hydrogen tank right here, another hydrogen tank here, and the fuel cell itself is underneath the front seats. Now, I think people would be concerned having a compressed gas tank on your car, but you do a lot of safety tests. We do a lot of testing, yes. Including shooting it with bullets. <laughs> we do, it's called the gunfire test. We shoot it with a 50 caliber armor piercing round. With the first shot, we weren't even able to penetrate one wall. But the second shot? The second shot went through and uh, it vented the hydrogen out. So this seems like a pretty safe tank, unless it gets shot twice in the exact same spot, you'll probably be okay. The car endured plenty of other testing during its 20 years of development. There's always some small condition that you didn't think about when you design it. In Toyota, we call that Genshin Gen boots, which means go and see. With test vehicles specially painted to disguise the look of its prototypes, Toyota spent years testing the cars under extreme conditions. From the blistering heat of Death Valley, we had temperatures up over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, to the bone-chilling cold of Yellowknife, Canada. 
Right now we're getting ready for our uh, cold start. So what pressure are we at? 62.3, so it's kind of slowing down. I was not expecting how cold it would be. Back in warm California, Jackie and I hopped in an older demo vehicle and headed to a nearby station to fill her up. This handle is cold to the touch. It's because as you fill it with hydrogen and the tank itself actually heats up as we're filling. So in order to minimize that effect and to get higher density gas in there, we pre-cool it, in this case, to minus 20 C. How much does it cost to fill up a car like this? It could be about five to seven dollars a kilogram, which means that for a vehicle like this, it would be around $30 to fill to go over 300 miles. So it's pretty comparable to what you would have with a normal car, but just zero emissions. Exactly, the idea is to completely replace your normal conventional vehicle and not have to make um, any of the sacrifices as far as refill time or range. How many of these fillings stations are there in California? There's nine, but there are more being built right now. Almost monthly, a new one comes online. For now, it kind of seems like a bit of a hurdle for people who would want to buy a car like this if they don't have access to the hydrogen. Yeah, the stations are definitely the biggest hurdle with the vehicles. Right now, there are only a few dozen stations across 17 states. I think she's filled up. Should we uh, go for a ride? Absolutely. California's tough emission standards were the catalyst for the development of the hydrogen car. And Toyota's just the first car maker to roll out a consumer version. GM, Honda, Hyundai, and Mercedes are all gearing up, too. So driving this car reminds me of the Prius that I drive, in which it is quiet. You hit the gas and you don't really hear anything, but you go faster. It kind of makes the drive a little bit more relaxing when you got this kind of a view. Another innovation right around the corner, cars that can talk to each other. The federal government is in the final stages of mandating vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication in all new cars, and our Dr. Shinny Samara went to check it out. I'm trying to kill him. So that was a genuine alert. <laughs> you were about to collide into the car in front. Ann Arbor, Michigan, home of the University of Michigan and its Transportation Research Institute, where they're testing the future of driving. Each vehicle has a dedicated short-range communication radio. So we're transmitting what we call the basic safety message, the vehicle speed, position, and heading. And so then we can compare that to our own vehicle and do any threat assessment and warn the driver accordingly. V2V works by surrounding each vehicle with a Wi-Fi-like system called dedicated short-range communications. It continuously shares a stream of data to other V2Vs, calculating the danger and triggering warnings when needed, like when there's a car you can't see unexpectedly braking, or when it's not safe to pass a slower car, or when a car is in a blind spot during a lane change. So that forward collision was because the car in front actually stopped and was an obstacle. Typically, an emergency electronic brake light is going to tell me, the driver, that someone ahead of me is braking hard. And not just braking, but braking hard. So panic braking. They're slamming on their brakes. May not even be in the lane in front of me, but it's in one of the lanes in front of me. So this is quite a blind spot, isn't it? You, you can't, can't see past the bush there. Yeah. So there's a tall bush. Tricky to pull out this one. So here. A particularly dreary day at General Motors Technical Center in Warren, Michigan, gave me an added dose of reality to test drive a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle safety alert system. Naturally, as a driver, when mm -hmm. you can't see the road, you do tend to kind of edge forward. So I'm going to do what mm -hmm. I would naturally do. So I'm edging forward. Oh, I did not see that one coming. Yep. That's one of the advantages of V2V is it works even if the driver can't see the approaching vehicle. General Motors is one of the nine major car makers working together to make V2V communication a reality, an unusual teaming in an enormously competitive industry. My car in a GM vehicle needs to talk to a, a Toyota vehicle, needs to talk to a Ford vehicle or a Hyundai vehicle, and they all need to be sending the same types of messages. So that can't happen 
if we go independently develop this, this type of technology. John Cap, the director of GM's V2V technology, also had a hand in building GM's current crash avoidance systems. Some of those alert systems already exist in more higher-end cars. What's different about the system that the V2V vehicles offer? Some of our Cadillacs today have six radars on them, two cameras and eight or ten ultrasonic sensors. But even those aren't enough to see several car lengths ahead of you or to see around a corner. So V2V technology starts to fill in those gaps and lets us have even more information to address some of those driving situations that are challenging. I'm going to be more reckless. OK. <laughs> Push the envelope. Yeah. My last chance. Whoa. Ah. What is a car doing stationary in the middle of my runway? You know what? I don't tend to look at that display. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's not meant to focus on. That's more informational. Did you see the scrolling red? Really, the alert that's going to provide you, you know, the intended responses on top of the dash. It's really important because yeah. for these type of alerts, we want to direct the person's attention, you know, to the road. So an alert that's high up within the driver's line of sight is really optimal for providing this type of information. Yeah. There'll be lots of applications once cars start to get V2V technology, and, and that, that's an example of one. That's just information between two cars. What happens when every car is kitted out with this technology? Wouldn't the system be completely overloaded with information? That's one of the technical challenges of similarly, you know, we need to develop a security system to make sure that, that unwanted messages don't get sent between vehicles. We think it's possible to get to a point someday where, you know, maybe crashes won't happen anymore, but it's going to take a while to get there. Up next are Costa Gramatis and a car that drives itself. Oh, oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> wow. We almost killed that guy. <laughs> we want to hear what you think about these stories. Join the conversation by following us on Twitter and at aljazeera.com slash techno. Here at Toyota's Technical Center in the weather testing room, where temperatures can range from blazing hot to freezing cold, just the touch of a button. Engineers like the ones here at Toyota have to take weather into account for a most ambitious innovation, the driverless car. The state of California is now granting licenses for autonomous vehicles, and our very own Costa Gramatis got to take one for a spin. The road to the driverless car has been a long one. We're all set for auto control. This is how General Motors envisioned the future back in 1957. You're now under automatic control. Hands off steering. That was then. This is now. I push a button, it takes my hands off. This is GM's concept car, the Opel Insignia, driving itself aided by onboard cameras, radar, and V2V technology. And I can take over at any time, manual control, right, grab the wheel. And come 2017, GM starts selling Cadillacs with Super Cruise, a semi-automated system that can let the car do much of the driving and even take control to avert a crash. What we found is that very quickly people get adjusted to the system, are willing to take their hands off the wheel and their feet off the, the pedals. GM's not the only automaker gearing up for driverless cars. Nissan is racing towards a 2020 deadline for their fully autonomous vehicle. And Nissan's top researcher, Tetsuya Ejima, let me figure out how it works. These are your, your, mm -hmm. your laser scanners. Yes. And they send out big beams of laser. Yes. And to determine how far the distance is. Yes. And then mm. here we have a big radar panel yeah. that can yeah. see 200 meters ahead. Yes. yes. And in the back of the car, we have mm. another radar panel here mm -hmm. and one over here as yeah, well. Yeah. And they determine 70 meters, 70 meters yeah. yes. uh, whether objects are approaching mm -hmm. the car or going yeah. away from the yeah. car. Yes. And then all of these little guys mm -hmm. are for parking. They're sonar. Yeah. Yeah. So they send out little chirps. And then you have cameras on every side of the yes. car. Yes. This yes. is a, a yes. normal Nissan Leaf, yes. but it's yes. totally a prototype. Yes. We're going to put autonomous mode. That's the autonomous button. Yes. Hit it. Yes. Autonomous <laughs> mode activated. So you have no hands. <laughs> the camera's reading the speed limit yeah, sign now. And input to the system. And we're going to watch yeah. it slow down. Yeah, yeah. Automatically. 
Red light. Camera. Camera's detecting it. Signal is red. Car says signal's red. Signal is green. How did it know to go left now instead of going to the right? Because it's reading the right. It's re it reads all yeah. those lines. Yes. So it follows the road using mm. the cameras. And what happens mm. if, a, if a kid comes out chasing a ball? Oh! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! <laughs> wow. We almost killed that guy. <laughs> it mm. makes a decision whether to mm. brake or swerve. Yeah. Can we park it now? Yeah. And, and we can do that from the back seat, right? Yeah. This is my space. <laughs> <laughs> it's calling dibs on that yeah. spot. And now it's parking. And the, the <laughs> I love watching the <laughs> steering wheel just spin itself. <laughs> what happens if I interrupt it? Stops. Completely stops. It will completely stop? Yeah. As car makers tinker with their driverless cars, researchers at Stanford University's Automobile Lab are using a state-of-the-art simulator to focus on the biggest wild card, the driver. What is the most dangerous time in an autonomous car? The moment when the car shifts control from itself to the driver. Drivers are totally disoriented, and they're being asked to absorb an enormous range of activities, an enormous range of things going on, to get what we call situation awareness, where there was none. And that turns out to be an extraordinary challenge. I am going to be placing the EEG electrodes on your head. Because we want to really understand what's going on in your brain and in your body and when you're driving. We can see where their eyes are looking because we have an eye tracker. They look great. What their brain is doing at various points. We can see what their heart is doing. This simulator was built to help us better understand ways to alert the driver that autonomous mode is being switched. After several minutes of texting while the car is driving, Watch what happens when I have to take control. Please disable automation. Car just asked me to disable automation. What? Why did the computer just decide to not? Uh oh. I just I just crashed in about twelve cars because I wasn't paying attention. I was going really fast. While I was crashing, the computer was measuring my response. That's what's called autonomic arousal. So it has to do with how essentially excited you are, how ready for action you are. And a good driver is neither too excited nor too calm. Making the car the designated driver will revolutionize how we drive, but it could be life-changing for someone like Steve Mahan, who is almost completely blind. Auto driving. Google gave Steve a glimpse of the future, inviting him to take the driver's seat in their first autonomous vehicle. Look, Ma, no hands. How'd that feel? Incredibly normal and abnormal at the same time. All the things that you do as you drive just immediately come back. So we're here at the stop sign. Yep. This is some of the best driving I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that you'll be able to be driving again in your lifetime? Absolutely. No returns. Shinny Somara on how crash test dummies are getting a digital makeover. Even with all the safety measures we told you about, there are still going to be accidents, as there are about six million of them every year. That's why researchers run their crash tests with dummies. And now those dummies are getting a little bit smarter as they cross that digital divide. Lights! Lights! Camera. 48 points. Go ahead and plumb bob, and then check height. And action. We call it the crash hall. Welcome to Crash Hall at the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety in Rutgersville, Virginia, where every year they'll smash and trash at least 70 brand new vehicles to let you know which new cars are safe. We have our high-speed cameras throughout the Crash Hall and within the vehicle itself that can capture 500 pictures per second. Tracking the cars at 40 miles per hour 
high-speed cameras allow researchers to slow down the accident to study how the body absorbs the effects of a crash. And it's all done with a fleet of state-of-the-art crash test dummies. The sensors in these dummies are high-precision accelerometers, load transducers, other sensors that can measure displacement of different body parts. With upwards of 50 embedded sensors, these are very pricey and pretty smart dummies. On each of these sensors, we are recording 10,000 samples of data per second. We have an investment of about $250,000 per dummy. That may make them technologically smart, but they're still not human. With dummies, of course, it's very difficult to predict things like soft tissue injuries. In the real world, we have things like aortic lacerations, lung contusions, damage to other internal organs that we just cannot replicate with some of these crash test dummies. There is a favorite dummy, the mid-sized male. At 5 foot 10 and 172 pounds, the mid-sized male is the most often used stand-in for humans. There has been talk for quite a while of developing more frail dummies that, say, would represent the aging population. It's not just the aging population fueling crash test upgrades, and that brought Techno Shinny Samara to the University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. And what is the focus of the research here? People with disabilities who use wheelchairs it's very different dynamics, isn't it, compared to a very typical person sitting in a car seat? Yes, it is. We'll see the person going under the seat belt. And in fact, they can completely come out of a wheelchair. And how realistic are those dummies? They are very simplified versions of the very complex human body. Crash test dummies have been used. 1949 and they've become ever more sophisticated but what researchers are finding here is that they can get ever closer to reality by using three-dimensional computer models for the body's exterior shinny volunteered for the process a three-dimensional laser scan capturing 500,000 points on the body in 12 seconds from that an avatar of the external body shape is created we can do body scan, but that's just the outside. Jean Wen Hu is one of the researchers creating the computational crash test dummies based on hundreds of MRIs. So what's the MRI capturing then? So MRI basically can capture soft tissues, internal organs, muscles, ligaments. The goal is to create a wide spectrum of digital dummies, not just the mid-sized man. What I find fascinating about the computer-generated models are the layers going from external all the way through to internal. Yeah. We have a statistical model that can predict the bone geometry based on your age, gender, stature, BMI, roughly two million elements two just million. on single person. This is a fantastic graphic of really illustrating the different impacts with different body shapes. Yeah, so this is just a, one example of how obesity is gonna affect the injury risk. Yeah. The obese person's belly has yes. a massive impact on the steering yes. wheel. Because all the fat right here and the belt cannot quickly load on the, onto the pelvis. For this particular simulation, this obese occupant will have higher lower extremity injuries than a lean person. That is an extreme example of momentum. Oh, work. yeah. In the future, we can just run this model thousands of times, and that will save uh, a lot of time as well as the money. Could computer-generated dummies put the real dummies out of business? We test new vehicle models, and you would need a very accurate computer model, probably from the auto manufacturer, that you could trust to conduct a virtual crash test on. Someday in the future, everything might be done with computer models. I think we're, we're safe to say we're going to be using vehicle crashes for some time to come. And that's a look at some of the latest innovations that will affect the way we will all be driving someday. That's it for the special edition of Techno. I'm Phil Torres, and it's time to take this hydrogen fuel car and hit the road. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google Plus, and more.